Thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate it very much. It's always um, nice to see familiar faces, but a lot of new faces here tonight. So I um, uh, hope to get to know you a little bit tonight. Um, tell me, just so I can know a little bit about you, is there anybody, is everybody here from Central Oregon? Are you from Jefferson, Crook, and Deschutes County? Anybody from outside those counties? You can't say Illinois, that doesn't count. Okay, you're all local, that's good. Well, good, we all live in the same backyard, so you'll learn a lot tonight about our backyard woodpeckers. Um, in addition to um, the writing I do and the tours, uh, I also have been studying woodpeckers in the Sierra Nevada, especially the black-backed woodpecker for the last three years for Institute for Bird Populations. And we've been learning a lot about blackbacks. And um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about blackbacks tonight, but not, not uh, too much in depth. Um, but so I'm a field biologist also and, and try to stay very active, learning mo as much as I can about woodpeckers. And I really fell in love with woodpeckers when I moved to Central Oregon, because here in Central Oregon we have uh, one of the greatest concentrations of nesting woodpeckers anywhere in North America. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I'm not going to do much advertising tonight. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can just come to the website. It's easy to remember. There are business cards on the back table, as well as an email list sign up if you like. I only send a few emails a year, and it's very easy to unsubscribe if you don't like what I'm sending. So um, basically, it's just a good way to keep in touch and see what, what I'm up to, what presentations I'm going to be giving, tours that are coming up, etc. I start every woodpecker talk with this Quote, it's my favorite quote. I'll give you a second to read it. It is generally agreeable to be in the company of individuals who are naturally animated and pleasant. I think most of you would agree with that. For this reason, nothing can be more gratifying than the society of woodpeckers in the forest. So that's a pretty bold statement for John James Audubon. And uh, I definitely agree with him. Um, I just got back last night, about midnight actually, from uh, Jalisco. Uh, I spent the last 10 days down here. This is about halfway down Mexico. Um, and I was leading tours and giving a talk down there for the Vallarta Bird Festival, um, where we got to see uh, the, the jungle down there is quite fascinating. It's kind of a, a lowland, Dry, relatively dry subtropical jungle um, and very productive and we got to see um, quite a few woodpeckers. The most common woodpecker there is, or the most conspicuous woodpecker there is the golden cheeked, um, which is somewhat related to uh, the acorn woodpecker in Oregon and the Lewis is the woodpecker in Oregon. Um, we also have, and that bird also is endemic to western Mexico. The other endemic woodpecker in that region is the gray-crowned woodpecker, much quieter and harder to find, but another endemic species. And then, of course, the pale-billed woodpecker, which is the closest living relative to the ivory-billed woodpecker and the imperial woodpecker, both of which may be extinct. So um, it was quite a treat to get to be down there in, in another woodpecker wonderland. Um, we, had, we also had lots of ladder-backed woodpeckers um, and lineated woodpecker, much very closely related to our pileated. And the world is full of woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are in the order Pisiformes, Pisiformes, you can say that any way you want, actually. These are the different families in the Pisiformes. Um, most of these are uh, in the old world, but we do have a few of them represented, especially the toucans uh, in the new world. Um, and then we have the Pisidae family. The Pisidae family includes the Rhinex, which are all Old World, one in Africa and one in Eurasia, the Piculates, which almost all of which are in South America, and then the subfamily Pisidae. The subfamily Pisidae is what we consider the true woodpeckers. These are the birds that we think of as woodpeckers when they come to our yards. If you saw a Piculate or a Rhinex coming to your yard, you would not probably think that's a woodpecker. The true woodpeckers in the world are divided up into four tribes, 26 genera, about 180 species, and 12 of which breed regularly in Oregon. 
And Oregon offers excellent habitat diversity. This shows um, the different forest types. And the best forest type diversity in Oregon occurs right about in here, which of course is where we live. And this is an area that we call woodpecker wonderland, where we have um, 11 species of breeding woodpeckers. Lewis is Williamson sapsucker, red-breasted and red-nape sapsuckers, downy, hairy, white-headed, black-back, three-toed, flicker, and pileated. All breeding in this region here. And if you go up into the Metolius River Basin, above Sisters, above Camp Sherman, then you have a decent chance of seeing all 11 species in one day. And on a really good day, you can see them before lunch. That usually requires a guide, though, and I might be able to hook you up with one. So uh, let me know if you're interested in having a guide to learn more about our local woodpeckers. What is it that allows us to have this um, great woodpecker and, in general, habitat diversity? Well, first of all, water. And when, we, when you put water on the dry side of the Cascades, it creates excellent habitat. And the Metolius Basin, in particular, has one of the steepest precipitation gradients uh, in, on the continent, with the Cascades Crest getting about 120 inches of rain equivalent each year. And just a few miles away, here's the scale, 12 miles, so just 10 miles away, only 11 inches of rain. What that does is it sets up narrow bands of habitat down the east slope. There's a band that's adapted to 80 inches of rain, another band adapted to 60, another one adapted to 40. And so as you go down in a very short area, you get incredible habitat diversity. Then the water that melts cascades down this slope, creating riparian or streamside habitat, which only further enhances the diversity of the region. So this really is the heart of Woodpecker Wonderland. Um, one of you asked me about finding pileateds earlier, and pileateds are a challenge in our region. They're much more common on the west side of the Cascades and in the coast range where it's wet and the trees are rotten because pileateds like that. Um, but they're easiest to find probably in this uh, Metolius watershed than they are down in the Bend area where we have mostly ponderosa pine and a lot of lodgepole. So the, the habitat diversity isn't quite as good um, from, from sisters south, or say, let's south of Broken Top, as it is up there in the Metolius Basin. The other thing we have in our region is fire. Fire creates also, uh, just further enhances the diversity of the habitat. It's a critical part of the ecology of our forests, and it's very important that fire uh, be allowed to remain to some extent um, to keep the forest healthy. And our region, this is the Sisters Ranger District here, and shows four, one, two, three, four, five different fire regimes that occur in the region. And you can see the Metolius Basin has all five of them right here. So we're talking about fires regularly occurring, uh, low intensity fires here at the lower elevations, and long years between fires, but very high intensity fires at the higher elevations. And each time one of these fires burns, it burns in a mosaic. We get some areas that are intensely burned, and some areas that are moderately burned, and some where there's just almost no burn. So it's not like a 90,000 acre B&B &B burn, burned 90,000 acres completely charred. Okay, it left a lot of mixed severity habitat in there. So add the water factor, okay, the diversity that already exists with the strata down the eastern slope, add the creeks and the riparian habitats, add the few little wetlands that are in that region, and then add a mosaic of different fire intensities and you get some incredible habitat diversity. And so where do woodpeckers fit into this diversity? How important are they? What is their role? What are their roles? Um, and could they be the key to healthy habitats? Well. We consider woodpeckers keystone organisms. Okay, a, a keystone, does everybody know what a keystone is? Yes? This is the keystone right here. And what happens if you take the keystone out of an arch? The arch collapses, right? So a keystone organism in an ecosystem is one without which 
the ecosystem would have difficulty surviving. Okay, or the removal of that organism from that ecosystem would cause detrimental impacts to the ecosystem. Woodpeckers are keystone organisms in all of the habitats where they live. Whether it's um, the, the river bottoms of the Mississippi, um, the, the plains, the Great Plains, um, into the Rockies, all the way through the desert habitats, uh, and into the far west where we live. Uh, woodpeckers are keystone organisms. They play several keystone roles. Um, a couple of those I'll, I'll just touch on briefly here, but then I want to get much more into their main keystone role. One of their important roles, um, especially the migratory sapsuckers, like the red-naped sapsucker, and to a lesser extent the Williamson sapsucker, is the rufous hummingbird in migration follows the migrant sapsuckers as they travel north every spring. And they feed on the sap created from the sap wells that are excavated by the sap suckers. Okay, so they often are arriving well before the, the, the native flowers start blooming. And they take advantage of this food source created by woodpeckers. So that is a keystone role. If the woodpeckers were taken away from that equation, the migration of the rufous hummingbird would be altered. Uh, another important keystone role is, you can imagine woodpeckers traveling around the forest and um, bumping up against trees everywhere they go, and they, they get fungal spores on their bodies. And as they move from tree to tree, they introduce those fungal spores to other trees, which helps facilitate decay in the forest. Okay, and you, at first you might think that's detrimental to woodpeckers because they need trees to be alive, but woodpeckers also need trees to be dead, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, the most important keystone role that woodpeckers play in our forests has to do with this bird, the mountain chickadee, and this bird, mountain bluebird. This little raptor, our, the smallest falcon in North America, the American kestrel. This little owl, the northern pygmy owl, and this little owl, the flammulated owl. And even this duck species, the barrow's golden eye. So what is this important role that woodpeckers play? What's, what do all those birds I just showed you have in common? Somebody can say it, I know you know. They all nest in cavities. And those cavities are excavated by woodpeckers. Okay? So you might think, how does a duck nest in a cavity? Well, they, for the most part, they are adapted to nesting in pileated woodpecker cavities, very large cavities. Sometimes they'll nest in natural openings and crevices that are created in a dead or dying tree, but in general they thrive better when the woodpecker population in a region is healthy and those cavities are available to them. So the excavation of cavities that, that woodpeckers um, generate, that woodpeckers um, create, is an incredible resource for healthy forests. Again, it's not just about all those little birds either. But here's, here's what uh, a cavity might look like that's excavated by a woodpecker. And you can imagine that not only can birds use this cavity um, when they, they toss out those chips, create that vacancy, There's a, this is a bluebird nest. You can see the uh, eggs down in the bottom of that cavity with the little bit of nesting material. There are actually 40 species of woodpeckers that, uh, excuse me, 40 species of birds in North America that depend upon woodpeckers for their cavities. But again, it's not just about the birds. Um, this is a tree I found with a rodent's seed stash inside a cavity. And there are many other animals that use cavities created by woodpeckers, including flying squirrels, um, the free Mexican free-tailed bat, the American marten, all use cavities excavated by woodpeckers. So this is the primary and the most important keystone role that the woodpeckers play. But how do they do it? Okay, it's not easy to slam your head against a tree. 
and it happens to do with woodpecker anatomy. Okay, inside the woodpecker has some incredible adaptations that allow it to slam its head against the tree without getting headaches, without getting concussions, without getting retinal hemorrhages. And to watch them excavate is quite a treat. This is, happens to be a buff-rumped woodpecker in Borneo excavating a cavity. He's a cute little woodpecker. He's not very big, but he's just as uh, feisty as all of our woodpeckers. Think about that, slamming your head against a tree like that. The sap suckers, they eat sap most of the year. They'll eat insects too, especially when they're feeding their young, but they eat sap most of the year. And look at this, this is all day long, every day. The sap sucker is hammering its head against these trees. This is a red-breasted sap sucker right here in Bend. Bam, bam, bam. Does it hurt yet? Can you feel it? The uh, woodpecker anatomy has fascinated scientists for many centuries. And the first uh, drawing that we have of um, a, the woodpecker anatomy is of the tongue structure of an Eurasian woodpecker by Giovanni Borelli um, in his uh, tome on the motion of animals. This was around uh, 1675. Okay, today we have much fancier technology such as this digital morphology lab where we can get uh, high resolution digital x-rays that allow us to get a three-dimensional uh, depiction of a woodpecker skeleton. This allows us then to get slices at any angle we want through that skeleton to study the woodpecker's structure. When scientists are trying to figure out how to make a safer football helmet or a safer motorcycle helmet, they study woodpeckers. Okay, really nobody should be playing football. It's really bad for our brains. And there's a book out that elucidates this and there's been a lot of controversy about it. Um, but there are a lot of long-term injuries that, that football players are just now telling the public. Um, and it's rampant. And in order to make the sport safe, I doubt the public is gonna tolerate canceling football. Do you? Uh, in order to do this, we need a safer football helmet. Okay, so to study how to make a safer football helmet, we study woodpeckers. Same with motorcycle helmets. So, just how hard is a woodpecker hitting its head? Okay, well if you were to do the same thing, if you were to exert the same amount of force as a woodpecker hitting your head, now, can you recognize this right here? What does that look like? Good. You guys are sharp tonight. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure you're paying attention. Okay. There's your head. I know that looks like my head, but I just want you to picture it as your head. Okay. When a woodpecker hits its head against the tree, it's exerting a force of 1,200 Gs. 1,200 times the force of gravity. Okay, and the, the resultant forces have to be dis dispersed backward through the woodpecker's cranium and skeletal anatomy. If you were to do the same thing to exert 1200 Gs of force, you would have to hit your head on a brick wall going 16 miles per hour, which almost certainly would result in your death. Please don't try this at home. So it's quite amazing. The woodpeckers have a, a couple of very uh, critical anatomical adaptations that make this possible. Uh, in our brains, inside our cranial cavities, we have um, a tremendous amount, relatively speaking, of cerebrospinal fluid. Our brains are sloshing around in this bath of what we call sometimes CS fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, okay? Literally sloshing around. And I've even read once uh, the description of our cerebrospinal fluid as providing a cushion for our brain. Okay, the truth is not the same. When we get hit in the head or get into a car accident, our brains, because we have that CS fluid in our, inside our cavity, our brain sloshes forward and slams against the front of our skull. Okay, then we get what's called a contra-coup injury, and the brain slams 
back against the back of our skull. And we can get two concussions out of it if the accident is severe enough. And again, this is because we have this so much cerebrospinal fluid. That doesn't sound like it's cushioning to me. Okay, instead the woodpeckers have almost no cerebrospinal fluid in their cranial cavities. Their brains are super tight inside their crania so that when they hammer, their brain does not move. It does not slam against the bone in the front of their head. Also, that bone is specially adapted. Both the frontal bone and the occipital bone, the front and the back of the skull, uh, are the, made of very spongy bone material. Not spongy like a sponge in your kitchen where you'd squish it, but spongy enough that it can disperse shock through the little fibers that go through here. Also, I'm pointing to this frontal overhang here because I have another schematic coming up I want to show you. This frontal overhang is especially pronounced in the woodpeckers that do the most heavy duty hammering. So here's the schematic and these are the genera of woodpeckers in Central Oregon. Okay, all 11 of our species in Central Oregon are represented here. And we go from the heavy duty excavators up at the top to what we call the weak excavators at the bottom. Okay, the black backed is the, probably the world's greatest excavator. Probably has the best adaptations overall throughout its anatomy to withstand the blows of its head against a tree. The benefit of this Excuse me, the benefit of this frontal bone here, see the frontal overhang on the black back and the sap sucker? Almost non-existent in these other birds. That benefit of that frontal overhang is when the bird hammers its head against a tree, the frontal overhang d helps direct the force downward away from the cranial cavity. Okay, so the brain again is protected by both the spongy bone in the front, the lack of CS fluid, and the fact that the force is, its anatomy has the forces going away from the most critical parts of its anatomy. The birds down here that are uh, weaker excavators don't have the same adaptations. You might also notice that the bills are straighter in these birds than they are in these three. Just slight curve here to these bills. And if you took a stick that was bent and slammed it against a wall, what would happen to it? It would break, right? If you took a straight stick and hit it straight against the wall, much less of a chance of it breaking, okay? Then, if you look at these bills from the top, you can see that the heavier duty excavators have much wider bases to their bills, and their nasal openings are way over on the sides of their bills. This is an adaptation to the, the nasal openings move to the side as an adaptation to help keep debris from falling into the nasal cavities. Because if you're hammering constantly, You've got things flying back at you, pieces of wood and other material coming back at you. The broad bill also, again, helps disperse those 1200 Gs of force so that when they reach the cranium area or the, below the cranium, they're much less substantial. The str narrower, straighter bill uh, here laterally um, is not such a great adaptation for hammering. doesn't disperse those forces as well. So here's what some of those skulls look like in reality, going from the flicker here around to the imperial woodpecker, which is related to the ivory build. And again, you can see that these are the heavy duty excavators, these four right here with that frontal overhang. And um, the best example on one end of the spectrum is uh, our black back is the heaviest duty, but the hairy is the one we see more often. So, um, I'm using that as an example here with his nice, fat, juicy grub in his mouth. In order to get that grub out, he's had to hammer a lot on the tree to get into that larval gallery or the tunnel that's been chewed away by the grub. And you can see here, the sh there's even a shadow cast by the frontal overhang. Uh, and notice again how broadly based the bill is and how the nasal openings are pushed over to the side. Okay, on the other end of the spectrum is the flicker. Now, what does the flicker eat, his favorite food? Did anybody know? Ants. The flicker eats more ants than any bird in North America. Well, you don't have to hammer very hard to eat ants. Okay? He sticks his bill in the ground most of the time, and he's sticking his long tongue down underground into the ant tunnels to gather ants. 
And the Flicker's uh, bill is very different. And so is his cranium. So you notice no frontal overhang and much larger nasal openings that are much higher up on the bill structure. Now, the flicker being a weak excavator doesn't mean that he doesn't excavate. And um, some of you may have had an experience a little bit like this. Am I right? Yeah, I think somebody came in and said, um, yeah, the, the only time I've ever talked about woodpeckers was when I was swearing at them. Um, so because if you're a weak excavator, you're going to be very opportunistic. You're going to take any chance you get to excavate a nest. Okay? He's not looking for food. Remember, he's eating ants. Okay? So he's not going to find ants in there, and he knows that. But what he does is he goes up to your house, and he goes, ooh, that sounds nice and hollow. That sounds easy to excavate. I think I'll make a hole there. So they make a hole. Then they look inside, and they see, oh, well, oh that's no good. So they move three feet. And they do another one. Anybody have this sound familiar to anybody? This is a big problem, okay? But it has a very easy solution, very easy. Um, there is a natural solution, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but there's, e there's even a, a sort of a man-made solution, and that is you can become a surrogate and provide a nest box for your flicker. Okay, flickers are the one woodpecker species across the continent that will most readily take to a box. You can put a box up on a tree near your house and the bird will be in there the same day. Okay, so again, they're opportunistic. Give them a chance to have what they want and they'll take advantage of it. And they should stop ha hammering on your house. They should stop excavating in your house. Now that's different from drumming. Now if you've got a nice uh, loud vent pipe on the top of your roof, and the woodpecker comes there in the morning and brrrr, at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. That's different. Okay, that bird's not looking for food. That bird is proclaiming its territory and attracting its mate. And you can rest assured that that's only going to occur for a couple of months out of the year. Okay, and then it'll go away. But as long as your house has the loudest, most resonant surface nearby, he's going to keep using it. Okay, there are ways to provide more resonant surfaces. Um, you can come up with something loud and attach it to a tree. Um, or better yet, uh, I've got another long-term solution that I'll share with you later. So these cavities are all over the forest. All woodpeckers nest in cavities every year in North America. And almost all of them roost every night throughout the year in a cavity. So they're, not only are they excavating cavities for, for nesting, but they're excavating year round. Then there are hundreds and thousands of cavities out there, okay, that have been created by the woodpeckers and used by these other birds. Um, one example is uh, this hole here. See those little sticks coming out of there? That's very typical of a house wren. Okay, house wrens carry many sticks and they just jam the sticks in there. It's not even fine sticks. I mean, they'll just jam sticks in there until that thing's almost full then go in and lay their eggs. But, so, these, so these nest cavities um, are out there. And these cavity dwellers need these woodpeckers to make the cavities for them. But more importantly, the woodpeckers really need snags to excavate the cavities. Okay, if, what happens if you try to excavate in a live tree? Anyone? The sap, not just sap all over your bill, but the sap's gonna constantly come in and keep filling in that hole, right? The tree has this mechanism um, that it's designed to protect the tree, to protect itself, okay? So really the best place to excavate is in a dead tree. And a dead tree is known as a snag. Um, all snags are dead, so you don't need to call them dead snags, okay? They're just snags. Some of them are standing snags, some of them are downed snags. Um, downed woody material is especially important for the pileated woodpecker because he eats what? He does eat grubs opportunistically. What's his favorite food? Termites, very yummy for the pileated woodpecker. Not quite his favorite. Ants, what kind? Carpenter, Carpenter ants, good. Okay, Carpenter ants are abundant in a wet, rotten forest. That's why there are more pileated woodpeckers on the west side of the Cascades and in the Coast Range. OK, 
Okay, there's but much better wet, rotten forest habitat over there. On our side, it's dry and it takes longer for wood to rot. And it's, in general, it's just, they have larger territories because the habitat's not as ideal for them. Um, but in general, uh, the dead tree, the snag, is what most woodpeckers are looking for to, to excavate their cavity, including the pileated woodpecker. So you can see this snag here has been heavily used, many cavities all the up and down. And unfortunately, this is what we see far too often. We have one snag standing that gets overused. And then that tree dies, it gets, I mean, it gets rotten, and it falls. And then we're left with no snags. Okay, then where are the woodpeckers going to excavate? Well, they're going to move and they're going to try to find another suitable excavating site. And this is where the problem lies. Okay. There are three primary problems that um, we have posed to woodpeckers and all the whole cavity nesting wildlife community. The first is we need places to live. Also, we can't excavate cavities, right? So we have to, we do need homes. So in order to build our homes, we have to take down some of the trees. Now we don't usually take down all of the trees. There are many trees and thank goodness this isn't what Central Oregon looks like, but um, this is taken from the airplane landing at uh, Burbank Airport. Uh, in general, we need dwellings. So we have to come up with a solution for that. Another problem is we, how many of you use wood products? Raise your hand. Come on. How many of you have used toilet paper in the last few days? Raise your hand. Come on. I see some people that aren't raising their hands. How many of you read a magazine once a month or a newspaper? Yeah, okay. Um, how many of you use cellulose explosives? Oh, not that many. Uh, all these things are made from wood products. Okay? As long as we need wood products, we are going to need to extract the wood from the forest. How we extract wood from the forest uh, and where we do it precisely depends on many factors. And that's another lecture topic. Okay? But we need to re-examine the way that we do it, especially in burned forest. As I mentioned earlier, burned forests are critical component of any forest habitat, especially in the West. Okay, all our forests evolved with fire, and we need to leave some of those burned trees as snags for the woodpeckers to excavate their cavities. Okay, it's very important for the ecology. So rather than leaving two trees and putting a W on them, making them wildlife trees, we need to look more closely at um, what we're doing all around the burned areas and leave large stands of snags uh, and scattered large snags uh, around to enhance the habitat. The third thing that we do, again, uh, I don't fault us for this, is we remove trees when they're unsafe. Um, in this litigious society, many public agencies are faced with the decision of uh, protecting themselves, many decisions about protecting themselves legally. They can't leave a dead tree standing, a snag, if it's going to jeopardize public safety. So they have to remove it. Okay? We also have another uh, challenge, and that's the aesthetics of snags. Some people, and maybe even some of you, li live in a neighborhood that has covenants, codes, and restrictions. And maybe those CCNRs say, no standing dead trees. Okay? But that's a big problem. for the ecology of our forest. We all have moved into this forest. We put our homes there and removed the trees to put our homes there. We need to do everything we can to retain snags as much as possible. So here are some solutions. One is to leave in areas that are less populated, in especially in areas with low traffic volume. We can leave snags standing especially big ones like this, they can be tremendous habitat value to wildlife. Even in heavily populated areas, on the edges of the populated areas, um, we can leave snags standing. This is a Santa Lee Hill Lagoon in San Diego County. So obviously there's no development in the lagoon, it's protected. There are, there are thousands, maybe millions of people living very close to this tree right here. 
but on the edge of that habitat, we can leave the snags standing, okay? And they become beneficial again to not only the uh, cavity dwelling wildlife, but excellent perches for raptors and flycatchers and other birds. In the burned forest, we need to reevaluate how we manage um, these forests, and we need to look at the burned forest as a critical part of the ecosystem there. And rather than going in and salvage cutting in burned forest, we need to be more careful about how we decide which trees get to stay and what size trees get to stay and how many trees get to stay. And we have to balance the need for the wood products with the need for the ecology, the healthy ecology of the forest. If the forest ecology is not healthy, it's going to trickle down to us somehow, someday, maybe not in your lifetime, but maybe in your grandchildren's lifetimes. And we have a responsibility. Since we know that this problem exists, we have a responsibility to uh, ensure that the forest ecology remains healthy. For years, um, we've been recruiting snags. So the kind of this buzzword I want you to remember is we need to recruit and retain snags. I talked about retaining. What is recruiting a snag? Creating a snag, killing a tree, right? It's not such a bad thing. Once you think about it, there are lots of trees out there and there are too many live trees. <laughs> That's a hard one to swallow. There are lots of uh, big nonprofit organizations spending a lot of money trying to convince you we need to plant trees, plant trees, plant trees, plant trees. Well, when we plant trees and we've got these huge forests of live trees, there's a problem. Okay, some of those trees need to be able to die on regular cycles. And we need to have what's called a broad succession of age classes of trees. So in a, any woodland, in a city park or in the forest, we need to have trees that are young and saplings, and we need to have seedlings, and we need to have um, trees that are 10 and 15 years old, and some that are 20, and 40, 20 to 40 years old, and some older trees. And trees of all ages need to be alive, and we need some dead ones mixed throughout that whole range in order to create the conditions that are healthy for the forest. So back in the olden days, we knew how to girdle trees. Today, we still know how to girdle trees, okay? And we can limb up trees is another good way to create a snag. Cut all the limbs um, and you can even top trees. And I have to give a major uh, shout out to the city of Bend or maybe, I honestly don't know exactly who to give the credit to, but maybe it's the Bend Parks and Rec Department. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but all over Bend, in lands managed by Ben Parks and Rec. They are very good about topping snags and not removing them at the bases. Remember that one picture I showed with the snag cut cleanly off at the base? Almost zero habitat value left for, in that kind of snag. This is, does this area look familiar to anybody? Yeah, where is it? Old Mill, Old Mill good. Here's the Deschutes River. There's shopping center right over here. Would you say this is a fairly heavily traveled area? Yeah, especially, uh, it'll be very heavily traveled when Dave Matthews comes this summer. Um, but, but yet, the Ben Parks and Rec Department has left these tall standing snags. They've topped them, okay? So they've eliminated the safety problem for the most part by topping the tree. They've taken the wind factor out, okay? Wind throw will drop a snag in one winter. Those two wildlife trees you saw in that clear cut, standing in the middle, those trees are gonna come down the following winter after that, those trees were cut. Okay, when you leave snags standing out by themselves, they're gonna fall. So you, in areas with heavy traffic, just top them. Even 10 feet up is gonna allow that snag to rot sufficiently so that it'll become a snag tree, it become a cavity tree for some species of woodpecker and then that cavity can be used by many organisms uh, from the, uh, the birds, the cavity nesting birds, all the way to the small mammals and the countless invertebrates that are introduced into trees through woodpecker excavated cavities. So again, I um, applaud 
Bend, whether it's City of Bend or Bend Parks and Rec, even in the smallest playgrounds in town, I've seen them top snags that are only, you know, 12 inch diameter trees, trees that are dead. They top them at 15 or 12 feet. It's perfect. It's a perfect way to create habitat. So somebody there has realized that these snags are a natural part of our forest and we need to um, support them in these efforts and we need to share these efforts with other management entities um, to make sure they know that uh, this is an important thing to do. You can also get involved in um, any local organization. How many of you are members of the local Audubon chapter? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Everybody should have raised their hand. Okay, we all have the, a, an interest in bird conservation, especially through um, snag, cat, snag and cavity conservation. And the local Audubon chapter is a great avenue for you to support um, cavity dwelling wildlife. This uh, cavity conservation initiative was started by uh, myself and some friends at the Southern California Bluebird Club. And uh, it's an effort to go out, in, especially to um, youth, um, to teach them about the importance of cavities and cavity dwelling wildlife communities. So there, there are many opportunities, whether it's a specialized project like this that you can, that now exists in Southern California, but could be implemented right here in Central Oregon, um, or is just becoming a member of uh, Oregon Wildlife, Oregon Wildlife Habitat Foundation. They are doing the same thing, uh, looking at protecting wildlife habitat and the ecological health of our forests and woodlands. So everything you can do to support woodpecker conservation is going to be healthy for our forests. Thank you very much. And if I could get Tim to hit the lights and I'd be happy to answer some questions for you. Anybody have any questions? I have one. Yeah. Uh, is there a, a right suet on the market that we ought to be putting out for birds? I look at the ingredients of the different stuff on the shelves and there's, there's just a wide range of stuff in them and I'm just wondering what is the right thing? Well, um, when it comes to choosing suet to feed your wildlife, your birds, we all know the squirrels like it too, uh, at your feeders, it, the, the only real concern we have in our region is the season. And when it's really warm out, you wanna avoid the suets that, are, that have a lot of fat in them uh, because the fat will, tends to um, liquidi, li liquefy and it, the birds can get it in their feathers and that's not healthy for them. Okay, they, in the summer, if you're keeping suet out in the summer, they make other types of suet called suet dough. And it has way lower fat content and is more like a cookie dough and is uh, healthier for the birds. As far as the different types of things that are in the suet, you know, different things in the suet may attract different birds. Um, does everybody notice that you don't get many warblers at your bird feeders, right? Or tanagers or... Um, vireos, they don't, they're not feeder birds. If you buy suet that has insects in it, you might get those birds coming to your feeders. Um, feeders that are suet that has fruit in it also can be very attractive to certain birds. Um, flickers, I know, love fruit and the, all woodpeckers love suet. If you want to attract woodpeckers to your feeders, the two best feeders you can have are suet feeders and peanut feeders, shelled peanuts. So the peanuts out of the shell. Um, those are the favorite uh, foods of woodpeckers. If you put up, if you put up those kind of, hello, if you put up those kind of feeders, uh, you're certain to get woodpeckers coming in. Good question. Any other questions? Anybody? Yes. You had said that there was something else you were going to talk about that might be a solution for the flickers. Did I miss what that was? Let's see. Putting boxes up is the best solution um, for the flicker problem. Retaining, oh, creating snags. That's the real solution. That's the real solution. So you can look at your property and decide which trees you're willing to sacrifice, allow them to become snags, and you've created future nest cavities for many generations of birds. 
In addition, you've created a drumming post. Okay, a snag is very resonant, and the woodpeckers will often choose a snag as a drumming post. And that might get them away from the flashing on the side of your house or your vent pipe or your insulators or whatever it is they're pounding on that's getting you up at five o'clock in the morning. Yes? What's the general lifespan of most of the woodpeckers that are, that are around here locally? How long do they live? Good question. Um, just on average, we're probably gonna say 10 years, maybe, maybe 15 for some of them. The, the, the pileated might live longer. Um, the record for longest lived woodpecker uh, that we have now is I think 21 years and that's a bird that's been monitored consistently for that whole period. Um, was banded as a nestling and then they've followed it along and it's uh, lasted quite a while out in the wild. Um, so the second part of that question, so then if they live, say they live 15 years, do they ever have to worry about wearing out their bill or does it kind of regenerate like their fingernails? Uh, the latter. It definitely, the, the, they have two um, parts to their bill. Those skull, those skull pictures I showed you, that's just the bony part of the bill. On top of that is something called the rampotheca, which is a keratin material, same thing that's in your fingernails and hair, and that's the part that does wear down and regrow. Okay, so the, the keratinous, um, Rampotheca helps, also helps disperse force and helps protect the bony part of the bill. So when we're looking at the anatomy pictures, we're looking at the inside, and what we actually see has another kind of a grayish colored uh, shell on the top of it. Good question. Yes? What preys on these woodpeckers? Do other, other birds eat them? Other critters? Yes, uh, woodpeckers do have predators. They don't have as many predators as small birds, but the primary predator for woodpeckers are, are the um, aerial raptors, the aerial predators. So the raptors such as the accipiters in particular. The accipiters are called true hawks because they catch their prey on the wing. Hawking means to catch on the wing. So swallows, hawk, night hawks, hawk for insects, okay? The true hawks, the sharp shin, the coopers, and the goshawk do prey on birds. Most sharp shinned hawks are too small to catch most woodpeckers. Okay, a large female sharpie might be able to catch a downy woodpecker, maybe a hairy, but more likely than Cooper's hawk becomes an important predator. It's a larger bird than the sharp shinned. The goshawk could take almost every woodpecker, probably except a pileated. Goshawk might have a hard time with a flicker also. That bill, is, even though the bird's a weak excavator, that bill can be pretty formidable and the hawk probably knows that. Um, so it, those avian predators are the ones that woodpeckers naturally are concerned about. Now we've done, we have another ecological problem um, and this relates in part uh, to the white-headed woodpecker but others uh, to a lesser extent. Um, we, the ponderosa pine forest is been altered over the last couple hundred years since we've been here and we've suppressed fire that has allowed the, an increase in woody material in the understory um, an increase in sh shrub layer favors um, the yellow pine chipmunk the increase in downed wood that occurs because we don't allow fire to go through and burn the downed wood favors the golden mantle ground squirrel those two species have become new predators for the white-headed woodpecker. Okay, they also need cavities. We have a lack of snags, so any cavity they can get to is going to be used. They're opportunistic. And if there's anything in their way, they will often depredate young woodpeckers in a nest, and they have been known to um, depredate adults as well. So we kind of, by tweaking the ecosystem, that's a, being very conservative by using that term, um, by tweaking the ecosystem, we've kind of created a situation where um, the birds now are faced with a predator that they haven't become adapted to. So in general, avian predators, but in certain specific cases, we've got some new predators that are, that are out there. Any other questions? Uh, Bill, can you talk a little bit about the feet and the tail? Sure, yeah, the, the anatomical adaptations of woodpecker definitely don't stop at the skull. Um, that again is, a, I could do a whole, my, one of my other favorite presentations is called Tongues, Toes, and Tails of Woodpeckers. 
Um, the adaptations go all the way into the neck, into the rib cage. There are special modified ribs and muscles attached to those ribs that allow the woodpecker to deliver a blow that can get up to 1,200 Gs. Those muscles and bones then also help redisperse the forces down away from the head and neck and eyes. Um, as, they go, as you go down the spine of the woodpecker, there's a, a fused set of bones at the base of the spine called the um, pygostyle. A woodpecker's pygostyle is much heavier duty than other birds, and the, bird, the woodpeckers that excavate the most, the blackback, hairy, downy, white-headed, they have the strongest pygostyle. That's designed to hold a special set of muscles that prop their tail up against the tree so that they, when they rear back, they can have leverage to hammer. Okay? Those tail feathers are especially designed. The shafts or the rachis of the feathers are extremely stiff, and the tips of the feathers are, are tapered with barbs. The ends of the feathers don't have barbs because they would just constantly wear off. Those stiff feathers, then, they can press against the surface when they're climbing and when they're excavating to help with leverage. So the combination of the pygostyle, the muscles attached to the pygostyle that control the tail feathers, and the stiffness of the tail feathers themselves are important. The feet of the woodpecker are also um, specially adapted for climbing. They have an outer toe that's movable. They, can, they have two toes forward. When they're at rest, if you're holding a woodpecker in your hand, or if you look at a flicker or a pileated on the ground, they're going to have two toes forward and two toes back. Okay, but that's a perching adaptation, not a climbing adaptation. What woodpeckers can do is when they have their two toes forward, they can take this third toe here and swing it around to the side. Okay, so that, how many of you rock climb? Anybody ever been rock climbing? Some of you? Okay, when you rock climb, do you hold on? Do you prefer to hold on like this? No, that's not so good, is it? You hold on like this, right? And sometimes like this on the side. Same thing, woodpeckers already knew that. They didn't have to learn it. Okay, so two toes up and one to the side. Often the fourth toe is laid flat and not even used when they're climbing. And the black back and three-toed woodpeckers have lost their fourth toe. They don't even have it. They're both three-toed woodpeckers because they spend so much of their lives vertical in the vertical plane that having that fourth toe underneath became useless to them and they lost it. Yes. Can you say something about the Lewis woodpecker? Uh, oh, what do you call it? Project. Oh, sure, the local project? Of course. Um, Lewis's woodpeckers um, are kind of a specialized woodpecker. They're also a weak excavator, so they prefer to use an old cavity excavated by another woodpecker. Same thing with flickers. Um, they will often take a small cavity excavated maybe by a hairy or a downy enlarge the opening and then go inside and enlarge the inside. But in general, they like to reuse cavities. Um, and the lack of snags in the, in the general habitat has made life difficult for Lewis's woodpeckers as much as it has the other woodpeckers, but the Lewis's in particular. Any of the birds that depend upon woodpeckers excavating have an even harder time than the woodpeckers themselves. Okay? So, in our region here, um, especially in burned forests, we tend to see a lot of Lewis's woodpeckers come in. Lewis's woodpeckers are fly catchers. They stand on a perch and go up and catch a bug and come back to the perch. Okay? They are really adept at this. They have special flight muscles. Their wings are shaped differently than most woodpeckers. And so they have these special needs for catching aerial insects. So those aerial insects are abundant in burned forest. And they also then um, have snags in a burned forest that they can use for nesting. The problem is, in our, locally burned for, our local burned forests, we often get um, higher intensity burns than maybe used to, that the wood, than the woodpeckers are used to. And so successive winters knock down all the snags, as I mentioned earlier. So in particular, we had the Aubrey Hall burn. Am I pointing in the right direction? Right out here. The Aubrey Hall burn was about 20 years ago. Okay, and it burned from Shevlin Park south in a long strip. And it was a high intensity fire. It was also salvage log because it was, it was um, before, this occurred before we started decreasing our salvage logging in Oregon. 
So it was salvage logged. Most of the trees were taken. The trees that were left were few. The Lewises definitely took advantage of them using cavities excavated by the blackbacks, hairies, whiteheads, uh, and downies. But those snags then started falling. So the local birders um, were concerned about this and they wanted to try to experiment to see if the Lewises might nest in a box. This had never been done before. Nobody had ever successfully gotten Lewis's woodpeckers to nest in an artificial structure. So um, it took a few years, but after a few years of experimenting, we got the Lewis's woodpeckers. The local Audubon chapter through started as East Cascades Bird Conservancy, um, got the Lewis's to nest in the boxes. And so now they have as many as 25 of the boxes that are in the Aubrey Hall area that are used every year, uh, successfully turning out uh, fledglings. And the best part of this is that because of the success of the project, conservation groups throughout the range of the Lewis's woodpecker have been able to replicate the program, to bring woodpeckers back to areas where they have been extirpated, and to support tenuous populations that have been having trouble because of the lack of snags. And uh, so it's been, a, it's been a neat project, it, and they're always looking for volunteers for that project. If, if you want to help monitor Lewis's woodpecker nest boxes out in Aubrey Hall right off of um, Century Drive, it's, it's a close, easy trip. Um, if you've got property that's in the open habitat, very open, like open juniper woodland, not dense juniper woodland, but very open, especially burned area, and you want to try to install a box for a Lewis's woodpecker, um, you can get the specifications on those boxes from the, the Audubon website. But I encourage you to, uh, to get involved with things like that. And that's part of what I mentioned earlier about getting involved in woodpecker conservation. Um, having those boxes up is going to benefit the Lewises, but then it's going to continue to benefit other cavity nesters. As the Lewises are uh, kind of um, an ephemeral species, they, they move on uh, on their own without us. They, they are nomadic. So some years you might get a bunch in one place and another year they're gone but then those cavities, uh, those boxes are still there. So it, the, the project has long lasting value and it's been very successful. Yes? Uh, for those woodpeckers that prey on uh, insects within a tree, do they have any specialized techniques for locating the, the honey holes? Good question. Um, okay, so let's use the blackback as, as the example since he's the master excavator. Okay, the question is, how do the woodpeckers get the prey that's inside the tree, right? Well, the blackback woodpecker, well, first of all, um, while the trees are still smoking, the longhorn beetles can sense the smoke from many, many miles away. They fly into the burn forest and they lay their eggs in the bark of the tree. Their eggs then, helped by the warmth of the uh, forest, um, hatch quickly and their larvae bore into the cambium of the tree. So then they create what's called larval galleries, which are these little tunnels where they've been chewing inside the wood of the tree. Okay? Those um, longhorn beetles can take up to four years for those larvae to go through multiple generations, we call those instars, multiple instars, then to pupate and then emerge as adults. Throughout that period, those larvae are available to any organism who's adapted well to feeding on them. So when you go into a recently burned forest, if you're really quiet on a quiet day when the wind is quiet and you're away from the traffic or whatever, you can hear this These are these large uh, longhorn beetle grubs eating inside the tree, okay? Sounds bizarre, but believe me, you go into a new burn and you'll hear that, okay? Um, so, number one answer is, if we can hear, the, hear that, the woodpeckers can certainly hear it. More importantly, the woodpeckers are probably very good at sound and resonance, right? This is a very important part of their lives. So they can go along the tree and go, and go, uh -huh. right? A little bit hollow there, not as hollow as right here. Yeah, this is good right here. Peck into the tree, into the cambium of the tree, the hard wood, blackback woodpecker, super adapted for this, okay? Then you have this long tongue that starts, the tip of the tongue is here at the end of the bill, it goes back, 
splits into two here, goes up over the top of your cranium, stops right about here. Every time you stick your tongue out, the whole thing unwinds and rewinds. Okay, the tip of the tongue has these little fish hook like barbs on it. Okay, the blackback woodpecker's tip of his tongue is fairly thin because it's perfectly adapted for sticking into that larval gallery. Okay, I've tapped in, I've found the hole, I stick my tongue up that larval gallery, I stick my tongue between the grub and the wall of its gallery, and I pull back. And I've used the hooks on the tip of my tongue to extract my prey. So do they have adaptations? Fascinating adaptations. How long? How long is the tongue? Um, the longest is the flicker. Um, the flicker's tongue, when it's at rest, the tip of the tongue is here at the end of the bill, okay? Then it goes back, it splits. This, is, this whole thing, by the way, is called a hyoid apparatus. Okay, so the tongue goes back, it splits here into two, forming a long, an elongated Y shape. Those two pieces come around the back of the cranium. They come together, they don't fuse, but they run next to each other. Most woodpeckers' tongues end right here about at the orbital socket. The flickers go past the orbital socket into the nasal opening inside the bill and into the upper mandible. So when the bird is at rest, both the tip and the terminal ends of its hyoid apparatus are in the bill structure. So the flicker's tongue can probably come about three inches past the tip of the, t of the bill. And it can do this many times a second, like a sewing machine. The flicker doesn't have the barbs on the tip of his tongue, though. Instead, what he's got is this long sandpapery section. Same material as the barbs. It's that keratin material, but just sandpapery, rough feeling. Then he's got a huge submaxillary salivary gland back in here. Every time that tongue goes out, it gets coated with that sticky saliva. And that rough part of its tongue, covered with that saliva, gets the ants glued to the outside, and it retracts, and the ants are stuck to the saliva. So each woodpecker species has a different, different intricacies, different new, sometimes very subtle nuances to its tongue shape and design um, for it, the specialized kind of feeding that it does. Yes? Does the lodgepole pine beetle kill create another environment, kind of like a, a forest firewood? You know, it, or are birds moving into that environment? Yes, and um, that's a good point. Um, the lodgepole pine beetle you're talking about is a bark beetle, not a wood borer. Okay, the wood borers are, are different families of beetles. The bark beetles have much shorter lifespan, and, this is, and they will attack live trees. Since they don't go into the cambium, they don't have to worry about the sap, right? If you're a wood boring beetle, you don't want to lay your eggs in a live tree because your larvae are going to start boring into there, and they're just going to drown in the sap. So that's why the wood borers probably take advantage of sick or dying or burned trees. The bark beetles, on the other hand, will come into a live stand of trees, lay their eggs in the bark. The eggs and larvae bore between the bark and the cambium of the tree. Okay? And they can kill the tree by girdling it, basically, by causing the bark to separate enough that the tree can die. And their lifespan is very short. I mentioned the lifespan of the wood borers can be as long as four years. Most bark beetles' lifespans are about a year. So they can come and go like this and cause widespread damage in a forest. Now, damage is relative. Bark beetles are natural, most of them. Not all of them are native to, to our forest, but many of them are native. Okay? We may have created situations in the forest that have weakened the trees to some extent and made them more susceptible to the bark beetles. But in general, bark beetles are designed, this is what they do. They, they go around and they're part of the forest ecology, just like the woodpeckers. Okay? Having dead trees is important for forest ecology. And those beetles are keystone organisms themselves. By causing the death of trees, they've helped further the ecology of the forest. So who eats bark beetles? Almost any woodpecker will eat bark beetles. They're easy to, they're easy to get. Right? You don't have to have the heavy-duty anatomy to get behind the bark, especially if it's loose. Right? So you just stick your tongue behind the bark and fish around a little bit and you find bark beetle larvae. 
Uh, termites also tend to be most abundant right there be between the bark and the cambium. Um, the three-toed woodpecker in particular is a bark beetle specialist. That's his main food. So the three-toe is, is an enigma to birders. They're hard to find because it's hard to know where those bark beetles are going to be all the time. In a burn forest, you can go the first year and sometimes the second year after the burn and know there's going to be three toes in there. For the third year and fourth year, the three toes, most of the three toes have moved on to wherever the beetles have gone. The blackbacks are still there because the wood boring larvae are still in the cambium of the tree. But the, the three toes are, are kind of mysterious. We don't really know everything about them, how to predict what their movements are going to be. Um, because the, um, the bark beetles don't respond to the same stimuli, i.e. the smoke that the wood borers are responding to, we don't know exactly what it is that draws them. Um, you know, the entomologists probably know a lot more about this than I do. Um, but uh, in general, you know, the bark beetles are, are another important food item for, for lots of woodpecker species. other than hiring a guide. <laughs> Best time to find them is um, spring and early summer, uh, when, particularly when they're vocal, okay, when, when they're drumming, and you can hear the drumming when you hear a brrrr in the forest. It's a woodpecker drumming. There's no other organism that does that in our forests. The sapsucker goes brrrr, ba, 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 ba. so a little stuttered or punctuated drum. Um, they, sap, they, all these birds also make different vocalizations. The sapsucker does a scream that goes So new noises in the woods that you haven't been hearing for a few months, such as drumming and screaming like that, is, your, is one clue. Um, another uh, good time is after the babies hatch, and especially after about a week. Okay, the first week of those babies hatching inside that cavity, um, they're pretty, they're relatively quiet. You could, it sounds like But it goes all day, often all day and all night. Okay, but as they get a little bigger, it's more like All day and all night. Okay, sometimes not at night because the dad goes in and roosts at night with the babies. So they're a little less vocal at night but they're constantly calling from inside that cavity. And it's pretty safe in there, relatively safe. So you'd think that's kind of not a very good idea to be making so much noise, it might attract predators, but check this out. That's a pretty cool adaptation to be inside a cavity with the hole is only that big. There are not that many predators that can get in there. Okay, I've seen bears tear into woodpecker cavities before. Now, I haven't seen it happen. I've seen cavities that I know have been depredated by a bear. But in general, that does not happen very often. Um, did, I, did I answer the question? Yeah. Go ahead. What's happening in the poultry bird area? Can we get in there? These are the old woodpeckers. There are lots of woodpeckers in there. One of the challenges in Pole Creek Burn is it's very large, and so it's hard to know exactly where they're going to be. Um, there are blackbacks and three toes in there. There are lots of harries in there. They, are, they move around a lot, so sometimes they're hard to get it, hard to find. The, most of the burn is open now, so you can get in there. Um, I, I, I would tell you to focus on the areas of mixed intensity fire. Okay, the high intensity parts of the burn tend to lose their, uh, their uh, food providing value earlier than the mixed intensity parts. The, so again, or look at boundaries between the two. You know, we call that an ecotone. If you've got a high intensity and a mid intensity burn, there's actually an ecotone between there, and lots of organisms like the ecotone. So find the areas that are boundaries between different types of burn, um, the areas between the riparian and the upland habitat. Um, you know, the, the, the high intensity burned lodgepole pine at the higher elevations has already lost its bark. So there are no more bark beetles in there in those stands. But those bark beetles have probably moved to the other stands that have live trees still in them. That's where I would go look for three toes. Um, blackbacks and harries are more vocal and more, more common and more abundant, so they're a little easier to find. Thank you very much. Um, I'll stick around in case you have other questions. Thanks to Tim, and thanks again for coming.